Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. So we are going to be talking about YouTube, all right? So uh, I want, you know, I like my presentations to be as interactive as possible. I'll probably ask you some questions, um, ask you to raise your hands. There is a lot of stuff in this presentation. So if you do have a question, I will try to call on you, but I may take a second and kind of come back around to you once I get through a certain percentage of it, because we do have five specific things to go through. But please feel free to ask your questions. Just raise your hand as we are going and I'll stop to answer them. Now, as we get into this today, first question I have for everybody here is who already has a YouTube channel that you've at least posted one video to? Okay, so a lot of you, okay, that, that's great, good for you. I'm gonna give you a slight warning as I start this here, right? In the name of this presentation is the first five steps, right? The first five steps. So if you're a little bit more advanced, you very well may learn a bunch of things today, but this is meant for people that are getting started, right? I just wanna be completely transparent and upfront about that, um, but we are covering a lot, and I do think you're probably gonna get some value here today. So to get started, one of my first things I wanna really emphasize uh, as we're going here you know, there's a lot of different places you can share your videos. And as the, the CEO of a, a school that teaches people how to use video in their business, we talk about all of them, and there are quite a few decisions to make. So as we look at YouTube, one of the first things I want to emphasize here is exactly what is YouTube. And I think a lot of times YouTube gets talked about as being sort of a social media platform, and I actually disagree with that. There are some social aspects, right? People can comment, they can like, that feels like it would on Facebook. But the reality is YouTube is owned by Google, and Google is the largest search engine in the world. In fact, sometimes YouTube is the largest search engine in the world. There have been certain months where there have been more searches performed on YouTube than on Google itself. So that's important. That's an important part of this to think about as we're talking about YouTube, is that YouTube is essentially a search engine and is less about social media engagement, right? Engagement's still really important. You'll get shown to more people if you get it, but it is primarily going to be a search engine, all right? Another thing to remember here, and it sounds like most of you already have a channel, so this is probably not for you, but I always tell people, if you're gonna get started on YouTube, it is a commitment. This is a lot of work. Think about the name, YouTube. It's your television channel, right? That's basically what the entire point of the company and the platform is. So you have to go into it thinking about it that way. This is something you're gonna to need to do consistently and you're going to need to be committed. And the most complicated, longest kinds of videos that any of our students usually make are YouTube videos, right? So I'm assuming you understand that, right? This is a big commitment, but the payoff can obviously be substantial because this is something that once you get it up and running, you can expect consistent results over a long period of time. It can be one of the most effective ways to market your business. And the last thing I'll say as we kind of get the ball rolling today, um, I was just talking to my, my partner, Michael, over there about a quote from Mr. Beast, who is the number one YouTuber in the world, right? Mr. Beast is absolutely dominant on YouTube. And he was saying the other day that you should expect to make 100 YouTube videos before you get any sort of results. 100 videos, all right? I'm not saying that. The number one guy on YouTube is saying that, right? So that's not necessarily true. There are definitely places you can get some, uh, some results and some impact before that. But I do think it's very helpful to go into this recognizing this is going to take some time. It's going to take some practice. And every time you make another video, you will get better at making videos, right? So it's very competitive, but can be a lot of payoff if you do it right. All right, so let's get started here. So the first thing I wanna mention as we get into these five steps here today is that I, I want you to be a little bit careful about thinking about this as anything other than just going through the normal process you would when you're building a marketing system, right? So what I'm gonna be going through, these five steps we're going over today, in a lot of ways, they're gonna be transferable. These are gonna be things that you could use on other platforms, that you could use in other forms of communication that aren't even necessarily video specific, because I think that's really important. A lot of times you come to a presentation like this, and you're gonna hear tactics, right? You're gonna hear strategies. You're gonna have somebody say, I want you to go make this exact video and post it, and here's what I got as the results. That can certainly be helpful, but that is not what we're gonna do today. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through a process, a way to think about this that's gonna future-proof your channel. 
So rather than giving you just, hey, go make these videos and everybody makes the same videos and hey, they work for a few months or a few weeks and then they stop working because everybody made the same thing. Instead, you're all gonna come out of this, this experience today with different ideas. You're gonna be making different kinds of content and if you do this correctly, and, you, and you, you know, it's gonna be some work, right? But if you do it correctly, you're gonna build a system and a platform for yourself that you can defend against competition, right? Even to the extent that if somebody comes in and tries to rip off your video ideas, it won't work for them like it works for you because your videos attract the ideal customer for your business, not for theirs, right? So that's what we're really talking about here today. And keep that in mind, because some of this stuff you're gonna find, hey, I could probably use this in other parts of my business, all right. So here's our five steps, okay? So if you wanna, we're gonna go over all five as we're going, but if you just wanna make a quick note on them, the very first step, and this is something if you haven't done it yet, but you've already made a bunch of videos, I'm gonna very strongly encourage you to go back and do it, and that is identifying and researching and really clarifying your ideal customer. This is why it really bothers me when somebody comes in and says, hey, tell me what I should make for YouTube. What videos should I make? And I say, well, I don't know. Who's your ideal customer, right? And everybody has a different ideal customer. Some people like first time home buyers. Some people like to do luxury. Some people want to work with, with move up buyers, right? Some people want to do relocation. Even within those categories, there are further niches. There's further ways of de defining that person we want to work with. That's really important. That's going to affect all of your marketing, not just YouTube, right? So that one's going to be very transferable. Once you've done that, the rest of what you do with any kind of content will be much clearer. You're going to know exactly what kinds of videos to make and you're going to have a strong sense of confidence that you're, you're investing your time in a way that's worth it. So we get to the second part which is to find your content pillars. That's going to be the, the topics, the categories that you come back to over and over and over again for, for probably years to come, right? Third thing we're gonna do is talk about creating a thorough outline for your first five videos, right? So remember, this is for, for beginners, so if you're not a beginner, these could be for, for your, your 10th or 20th videos, wherever point you are in that process. We're gonna talk a little bit about recording, editing, and posting simple versions to get started, and then ultimately analyzing your performance, collecting feedback, and making adjustments. And that's a part of this, that this is what Mr. Beast was talking about when he said you gotta make 100 videos is you got to experiment, right? You got to get the data. You got to be able to look at that chart and say, okay, at this point in the video, all the people stop watching and then go look at what you said and figure out why they did, decided to not watch you anymore beyond that point. Once you've done that, your content will, will get better as a result, right? So this is a process we're probably going to sort of repeat over and over and over again over time. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. So obviously the, the key to success here, and this is something that I think is a little different than what you might hear about YouTube from other presenters, is that we're really gonna try to focus on you and your ideal customer, right? So over the next five to 10 minutes, we're probably all gonna sort of come out of this with different ideas of the kinds of videos you should be making. And I know that that's duh, right? Like most of you are probably already making video that's sort of meant for your ideal customer. But the reality is when I've asked most agents, hey, tell me about that ideal customer. Tell me the specifics. Give me what that person does for a living. Give me how many children they have if they have any. Tell me what part of town they live in. Most agents can't. They, wow, well, I'll work with anybody, right? That's not helpful. I can't make content that's gonna attract everybody, right? In fact, that's a good way to get nobody's attention. Instead, I need to do this work and I have to be specific. So, this is my next question for you, and I don't want you to feel bad if the answer is no, but I want you to raise your hand if you have a written definition of your ideal customer, like you've written down a bunch of information about the perfect person for you and your business. All right, so everybody give those folks a round of applause real quick. That's awesome, good for you, right? That takes discipline, it takes time, it takes effort, it gives you clarity that is, I mean, it's amazing. I'll tell you, I've done this a few times, especially when I start a new business from scratch. Once I've defined that ideal customer, everything else sort of just lays out in front of me because I know who it is I'm talking to, I know what they care about, and it's so much easier to find the message that's going to attract that person, but you're gonna have to do a little bit of soul searching here, right? So we're gonna go through how to do this here over the next few slides. But it, it, it might be a little bit intimidating and you might run into some frustration. So here's how we do this, right? Before we make any sort of videos, before we even start planning our videos, I need to know who this content is meant for. So here's the process that I recommend you go through. There's two ways to think about this. Number one is I like my current clients, all right? 
and I'm not saying any of you don't like your current clients, but if you can look at your current customers and you say, you know what, if I could take these three or four people, I loved working with them, it was fun, they were look, you know, type of properties I like to look at, whatever that definition for you is, and you can say to yourself, if I could just work with more people like these folks, that's great, right? We're gonna build our customer avatar, our profile of our ideal customer, on those people, right? We've got examples, that's probably the most straightforward way to do this. On the other hand, this is your opportunity to make changes. So if you're in a situation where you've been going, you know, for a while, like one of, one of the most common examples of this is I've spent a long time working with first time home buyers and I'm ready to move on, right? I wanna to start to adjust the kinds of customers that I attract into my business. This is your chance to do that. Because as we define this ideal customer, we can build it from, we call it an aspir it's aspirational, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a customer that I would really like to work with that I don't currently work with, right? So that's the first thing you have to think about. So think, you know, take a few seconds here and ask yourself, hey, do I have some current clients? It doesn't have to be all of them, but a few, that if I could just make copies of those people and work with them for the rest of my career, that would be amazing. Then I want you to think about those people for the next couple minutes, right? This is where you're gonna wanna probably take some, some notes on a piece of paper or on your phone, right? If that doesn't sound exciting, right, that's okay. We're gonna do this from a perspective of you get to decide what this person looks like. You get to define them from scratch and you get to move your business in a new direction. And anytime in the future that you wanna do that, anytime you wanna adjust the kind of customers you're working with, this is always the first step, right? We come back to the process, we redefine our customer avatar, and we include the parts that are important to us. So, this is what I'm talking about, there being a lot of text on these slides. You're not expected to necessarily be able to read all of that there, um, but if you downloaded them, you can look at it on your phone, right? So here's what we're gonna do. We are going to create what's called a customer avatar. Now, this is the hard part. A customer avatar is not a general definition. This is not, well, my customer tends to be between the age of 40 and 60. Or they tend to, you know, maybe be a woman, but sometimes I work with men, right? That's not the idea here. The idea is actually to define an exact person. So I want to know exactly how old this person is. They are 46 years old. They are, uh, they are uh, you know, an executive by profession. They live in this specific area. They have two children and they're these ages. I want to be as exact as I possibly can be. And the reason you want to do that, that's hard, right? Because you're going to think, oh, but I got one client that's 60 and they're amazing and this other one's 42. If you need to, take an average, right? Find the average between those ages. But we have to be precise because this is about how human beings work. If I try to make content that appeals to a range of people, I will not be as compelling as I will be if I think of one exact person. This is what big businesses do. So if you're sitting out there saying, but I've got too many different kinds of people I work with, I can't figure out how to define this. If Walmart can figure out how to define this person, you can certainly figure out. If Oprah, Oprah had a customer avatar for her show. Think about how many people watched that show. But she still had an exact customer avatar that she would ask herself, will this person like this clip? Will they like this segment, right? And all the people that were similar to that person loved her show. It's part of why she was so successful for so long. So this is hard, but it is totally worth it because what your brain is gonna do is every time you sit down to make content in the future, it's gonna imagine this person. This person's gonna pop into your mind. You're gonna think about having a back and forth conversation with them, and that will make you as compelling as you can possibly be. You're gonna use the right words, the right phrases. You're gonna to talk to them with the amount of, of, of energy and emotion that fits their personality, and you will be more compelling as a result, all right? So what I'm gonna tell you right now, you might be looking at this going like, yeah, but can't I just make like neighborhood tour videos for now and I'll get leads? Yes, but what I'm doing for you right now is I'm trying to future-proof this for you. Everybody can make neighborhood tour videos, and over the next few years, most agents that get into video are probably going to, right? Once there's enough of those kinds of videos, they don't cut through the noise anymore. You're not gonna show up as high in the search results. So if you've thought more carefully about your ideal customer and you've developed content that resonates with that person, that is much harder to copy and it's gonna keep you relevant for a lot longer, right? So by all means, neighborhood tours, all that stuff, where you're focusing on your community and talking about real estate, please do it. It's definitely part of this process. But if you know this customer, you can find other things to talk about that's gonna get you in front of them earlier in the process, right? This is something, a lot. again, a lot of big companies do it. Now small businesses can too. 
And so the idea here is that if I know this person and I'm talking to them, maybe they're not thinking about moving in the next six months. They're not necessarily out there researching real estate. But if I'm talking to to them about things they already care about, when they are ready to move, I'm already in front of them, right? They're not going to go out and start searching for other agents. They've already decided they're going to work with me, and I've future-proofed myself against that competition, right? So that's kind of the idea behind this. So what are we trying to put together? What information do we need for a customer avatar? There's two primary categories here, demographic and psychographic information. Demographic is useful to know. That's their name, like their age, their gender, their zip code, their job, education level, all these things that help you really picture and imagine a very specific person. Do not reference those things when you make the videos, okay? Because that, that's discrimination at that point, right? So you cannot put this stuff in the ads. You can't say, hey, are you a 42-year-old woman who lives in the... No, you're going to get in trouble for that, right? <laughs> Don't do that. But in terms of being able to think of someone specific, very helpful information to have. In fact, if we go back to that last slide, you'll see that we even put a picture of a person on this. And her name is Amy. We even gave her a name, right? That can be helpful too. So you want to make sure you have all that information, but that's more for for your own internal use. The stuff that's going to define what your videos and content are about is in that second category. And that's what we call psychographic information. The easiest way to think about this is how the person thinks, right? This is their personality. These are the things they care about. These are the painful experiences they've been through. And in particular, those three that are highlighted are really where you're going to find the gold, right? What are their pain points? So this is the thing. It's not just real estate pain points, right? You might say, well, they just had another kid. They need a bigger house. That's pretty obviously attached to, hey, I need to buy a bigger house, right? Real estate. But you can also ask yourself, what are the other pain points they're going through? Because I'll tell you right now, if you make a video that helps somebody figure something out in their life that is not related to real estate, they are going to want to continue to see things from you, right? So this might require a little vulnerability. It's not the easiest video always make talking about parts of your life that are hard, but that is the kind of content people will appreciate more than anything else, and it will get you in front of them in a way that really matters. Obviously, a big one is interests. Interests is, is a, is a no-brainer, and I'll show you how to use those in just a second. And then also where they spend their time. That can also be very useful in terms of knowing what kind of content to make and also where to put that content. All right, so we're going to move on from the avatar here in just a second. Easiest way to do this is if you do have those customers who are ideal and you want to do more business with them, just interview them, right? I mean, you'd be surprised. You might think it's kind of weird to ask somebody like, hey, I really like working with you. Like, can I ask you questions about your personality so I can find more people like you? Like, so maybe don't, don't say it that way, right? But you can ask them, hey, you know, it's been great working with you. Um, I want to get to know you a little bit better. You know, I want to just sort of figure more about like what, what makes you tick and what you're interested in because it's going to help me make more videos that somebody like you might enjoy watching. Most people are flattered by that and they're very happy to answer those questions, right? And don't be afraid to push a little bit, right? A lot of these folks you know pretty well. I mean, they're going to answer most of what you want. And so just dig in a little bit, ask them a few of these questions, and that's going to help you to define this profile. If, uh, if you don't have a current customer that you're going to be able to ask these questions to, you might uh, maybe either find somebody who's not a current client that wouldn't mind answering them for you, or it's okay to guess, right? So if you do need to guess a little bit, if you had to sort of think about hypothetically, what would this person find engaging, interesting, et cetera, that is okay to approach it that way. Last thing you can do to define this avatar and start to understand who it is you're working with is check local groups, right? So one of the things I like about Facebook is they have all these really uh, popular groups. They, they, a couple years ago, they made a big effort to push groups. You know, they got all of us to join more groups and made them more engaging, all that kind of stuff. So you can look at that, right? So if you can go in and see what are, what are your interests, what are the things that you're excited to talk about, where are people spending their time talking about those things in these Facebook groups, that's also going to help you define this customer. So now that we have that customer defined, and I, and I want to emphasize this, please do not skip that step. I know that that's not something you probably came in here expecting to hear about YouTube. It's like, oh, I got to make this go, go make this customer avatar. I'll tell you what, it'll take you a few hours. It is a bit of work. It'll give you clarity that you've never had before. I'm not kidding. It'll make what you're doing moving forward so much more obvious, and it will affect other parts of your business not just YouTube, right? So do that work and then everything else from here is going to become much easier. Now how do we use that information, right? This is where it gets a little more exciting because we're going to actually start to get some, some data and stuff out of this. So one of the things that, is, that, that I did not understand when I started marketing, I started getting into to video in particular, is that I didn't understand the idea that you should talk about the same few things 
over and over and over and say almost word for word the exact same things all the time. Right? Like one of the things I say all the time is that video is a form of communication. I probably say that like a hundred times a week and I will continue saying it for most of the rest of my life until everybody understands that. And it's repetitive, right? It can get a little bit redundant. But that's the idea. You get known for the things you say over and over again, right? So this is where you're sort of defining who you are to this audience. What are the topics that you're going to be known for? If somebody were to come to you and they were to, to have a conversation with you, what are the things that you want them to expect to be able to have a really good conversation with you about, right? We're going to call those our themes. We also call these content pillars. So you've probably heard one of those two terms at some point. But these are the things we want to come back to over and over and over again, right? Now, one mistake a lot of folks will make is they say, great, I've got these ideas, I've got these topics I like talking about, and they go start making videos about them and they skip this next step you see on the slide, which is these themes need to have a local twist. So I'm going to give you my, one of my examples, all right? Um, Show of hands if anybody's an MLS soccer fan. Anybody like a soccer fan at all? I hope there's a few. I know it's not that big a deal, right? But there's a few soccer fans here, okay? So in St. Louis, we just launched a new MLS team five weeks ago. Our team has won every single game so far and is in first place in the entire league, all right? So we're, we're feeling a little cocky. Uh, we, we were definitely overperforming. We're all talking about it. I mean, St. Louis is like a diehard soccer city. Every single kid plays soccer. It's like an obsession for us, right? I talk about soccer all the time. And guess what? People know me for it. They, they have a relationship with me, right? They like it too. They want to keep talking about it. This is something I, I really messed up when I first started this stuff, is I thought, hey, I got to be on all these different topics, showing people new stuff all the time. What happens when you do that way is you lose interest, right? So I grab this guy's interest, but then I stop talking about the same thing and I lose it, right? Grab this next person's interest and lose it again. So you want to find those themes, but you got to spin it locally. So instead of me talking about EPL, talking about you know, the, the most popular teams in Europe, I talk a lot about City SC, which is the name of our soccer team in St. Louis, right? So therefore, people in St. Louis, where I could do business, are going to care about it. Now, my business is a little bit different. I work with people all over the country, so you know, that's not a literal example necessarily. But for you, you want to lo work locally. So think about it this way. Either your content, your themes, need to be spun to your city where you live, but they can go even more narrow, right? So if you're in a really big area with, with maybe several million or more people, you can get even more narrow, right? So like in St. Louis, about three million of us, and I live in South St. Louis, South City, there's probably about 100,000 people in that general area. I could talk about things that are, that are specific to that. For, for my example of soccer, right, I could start to highlight all the parks in that part of the city that have nice soccer fields. I could do reviews of those, right? There's all kinds of different examples of this, but you got to have a local spin when it comes to real estate. Otherwise, you're going to gain lots of followers from all over the country, and most of them will never be able to hire you, right? Now, if they relocate, great. Some people specialize in that. That's obviously a little different, but otherwise, you want to make sure there's a local spin to all this. This is one of my favorite parts right here, okay? So once you know who your ideal customer is, what they care about, what are the topics that they want to see more of, then you need to ask yourself, what are you interested in, right? What experiences have you had? What are the things you enjoy talking about? Because if you don't do it that way, if you only focus on your ideal customer and what they care about, you will burn out. Because if you're trying to make videos about things that you don't care about, you will get bored, right? Because YouTube videos are a lot of work, right? I don't want to spend hours editing something that's about a topic that I don't care about, right? So this is where you find the goal. I'm going to take all the things, all the interests and pain points that this ideal customer has. I'm going to take all my own interests and pain points, and I'm going to find the overlap. And this is where you're going to find three, four, five. That's it. I don't want more than five. Three is usually kind of my minimum three to five topics that I can come back to over and over again that my ideal customer likes, that I like, and that we're going to have in common. If you're having trouble figuring this out, this is a sort of a technique I recommend. Think about when you go to a networking event and you get into small talk type conversations with somebody at that event, what are the types of topics you tend to come back to over and over again, right? Is there a local sports team? Are you into the food scene? You know, what is it that you tend to like to talk to people about? That's what you're probably going to find as these themes. Okay, so that's what we're going for there. All right, so here's a few examples, right? Because I think this can this can be kind of tricky. So I want to kind of go over a few examples of what this looks like. So first of all, you're always going to have real estate. 
right? So you're not going to skip real estate. That's not the point. I don't want you to build a channel that doesn't talk about real estate at all, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the only thing you talk about. Now, again, I've talked to a few people here, and if you're saying, but all my channel is about real estate and it's working, that's awesome, and it probably will continue to for a while. In fact, if you got out there before anybody else, you can be that agent. You already have subscribers. You did the hard work before anybody else was willing to, right? But for most of us that are starting today, it's going to be very beneficial to have a mix. And the reason I recommend that is that think about this, right? So let's look at this example. In this case, our ideal customer is a move-up buyer with a young family. Probably just had another kid, and now they need, a, they need that extra bedroom, right? So real estate-related topics, we could talk about highlight or tour videos. That's a big one, right? You go into a neighborhood, you feature that neighborhood, you talk about the pros, the cons. People love that kind of content. Buyer or seller advice, real estate market updates, and maybe listing videos. Now, just a quick side note. This is not, I'm not saying if you're working with move-up buyers, you need to pick all these. You've got to do the work and decide for yourself but these would probably work. Now, why have the other topics, right? So in this case, you might say family-friendly family local amenities like daycare centers, parks, things like that, local entertainment ideas for kids, and then something like interviews with school principals, right? The thing, some of that's gonna be a little bit real estate related, but what that has the potential to do is it has the potential to put you in front of this person before they start to think about real estate. This is the future proofing your channel part, right? So now this person, when they have that first kid, might be out there looking up things to do with their kid in the area. They meet me, they watch my content, they appreciate it, they start to build that parasocial relationship with me, and then they start to see some of my real estate content mixed in. They don't necessarily care about the real estate content yet, but now they know I'm an agent, they appreciate that I'm a key contributor to their community, I'm sharing some things with them that they're learning from. When it comes time to move, now I'm the first person they're gonna think of, right? So even if they go out there and start looking for other videos about what neighborhoods to look at, they already know I'm an agent, there's a very good chance I'm gonna get that business even if they see somebody else's content, right? So that's what we're trying to do here. Let's talk about another example. So first time home buyer, this one's a fairly common one, right? So in this case, we might look at affordable neighborhoods and properties, first time home buyer education, and then financing your first home. We could make all kinds of videos on each of those topics. Then we might look at fun events, nightlife. So these are you know, younger folks, right? So best, best uh, restaurants for date night, reviews of local nightlife or breweries, um, upcoming events for young folks in that area. Um, and then we might also, a lot of these people, there's a lot of research now that shows millennials will buy a, a dog before they have a kid. So most millennials at this point in their life have a dog or a cat. So we could also talk about that, right? And then a final example here, this is an empty nester. You can start to see there's some pretty distinct differences here, right? So market update info for sellers. In this case, they're a seller. A first time home buyer doesn't have anything to sell, right? So we're not gonna make seller videos for first time home buyers. Tips for updating older homes or decluttering, listing videos of low maintenance ranch or condo homes. And then we touch, touch on retirement advice and grandchildren. And again, these are not the ones you should necessarily use. These are just examples. But we can see here how the three agents that have these three channels are gonna have drastically different content on their channels. And if they approach it that way, instead of just making what everybody else is making, in the long term, they're gonna to continue to be differentiated, right? They're gonna stand out. And for this kind of customer, they are gonna fit like a glove. And that's the idea behind this, right? All right, so last thing I'll say here, I know this can be confusing. I know it's a lot of work. I know it can feel a little bit overwhelming. Just don't overthink it, right? The idea here is just to put a little bit of work into making sure that what you're talking about in your content attracts the right kinds of people. And for some of you, if you've been doing this for a while and you're not getting the results you want, this could be the problem. It could be that you're just making content that's not appealing to anybody specific. You're making something that's just a little too generic, and this is the trend, right? So when we talk about YouTube, it's your TV channel. What is your channel ultimately about, right? Why would somebody tune in, and who is it you're trying to attract? There's not a single TV channel out there that was ever made to attract everyone. I mean, even our news stations are meant for, for different kinds of people at this point, right? So gotta make sure you customize what you're doing for those folks. All right, now this is where we start to get into the actual making the videos part, right? This is the good stuff. So we wanna pull five specific video ideas from your content pillars, all right? Now, one of the reasons I didn't put in here a ton of tips on like how to write the scripts and all that kind of stuff here is because I wanna emphasize the, the experimentation. So I'm gonna ask you a quick question. I probably should have asked this a little bit earlier, but after I said that Mr. Beast quote, how many of you have made more than 100 YouTube videos? We got, we got one, okay, got a few. 
Uh, those of you that have made over 100 videos, have you started to get some business or have you gotten business in the past? I, I know you have, right? Anybody else? Some getting there? Getting there? Okay. Has anybody made like just a few videos but already gotten some business from it? No? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe one sort of thing. Okay. That's great. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm not judging at all. I'm just sort of curious there because, yeah, I think the reality is it takes a lot of repetition. And I think I've taught, man, I've taught so many students. I'll have people come into our school. They've never made a single video in their life. They've never sent any video messages. They've never made any simpler videos. And they want to make four videos and put them on YouTube and just get a bunch of leads. And I'm like, hey, I mean, I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry. Like, I don't know a single person that's really ever done that. You know what I mean? Like, I know a lot of agents that are extremely successful at YouTube, and they started six years ago, and their first 100 videos didn't get any views. So don't know what to tell you, right? So I'm not, I'm not saying that at all to discourage you, but I am saying that I don't want you to overthink your first five videos or even your next five videos. I just want you to focus on getting them done, right? So we want to get these ideas out. We want to create an outline. So I want to talk about that for just a second, right? At least in my experience, one of the hardest parts of YouTube is your video needs to be long, right? In fact, in most cases, you're going to want this is, and we're not talking shorts. They're literally called shorts, so those are not long, obviously, right? But we're talking seven plus minutes. A lot of folks are going to recommend even longer than that in some cases. One thing to remember with any platform is that you are, you, you are on a platform that's trying to make money, right? So if you can make it easier for them to make money, they're going to make it easier for you to make money, right? If your video is over seven minutes, any guesses what that means they can do? They can put an advertisement in the middle of it, right? That's what, that's what Google's looking for. So they can make twice as much money. They can always put an ad in front of it, but if it's long enough, they can put one in the middle. They're going to make more money. They're going to be more likely to show your video, right? That's a long video. Seven, or, seven minutes or longer, that's a lot of content. That's a lot of stuff you got to talk about, right? So it is important you think this through. You're going to want to make sure you have a structure, right? One really important aspect of any video is you got to have a good hook. So one of the most important things to think about here is you have to ask yourself, can you explain to someone in that first minute of the video, in the first, I would say, 10 seconds of that video, exactly why they're going to want to watch the rest of it, right? If your idea is more complicated than that, so in a lot of ways, it's like, can you describe the video in one sentence? If it's more complicated than that, you probably need to simplify, right? So we want to make sure we, we can tell somebody in that first sentence what exactly the video is about. You can elaborate for a couple more sentences, right? But make sure in that first little portion of the video, they know exactly what they're going to get in the rest of it. Then you're going to have the body, right? This is where you tell the story. Now, this is a, this is a big question. Are you going to have a full script or are you going to have bullet points? I'm not going to tell you which to do because everybody's going to have a different preference. If you do go the scripted route, make sure you know the script really well. You're going to want to, re you're going to, want to rehearse it, have read it a bunch of times. The thing that will make you sound scripted versus natural is how familiar you are with the words, right? So if you're reading the words off a teleprompter for the very first time, it's going to sound scripted because you're literally reading, right? If you're familiar with it, it will come across much more organically. A lot of people don't like scripted videos at all, right? So if you just want to have bullet points, you want to have sort of your main points you're trying to make throughout that content, that's another great way to do it. I would still probably recommend rehearsing. Here's a, here's a bit of a pro tip, though, is hit the record button while you're rehearsing, and sometimes you trick yourself into making a better video. So we, we used to do this in the studio. we tell somebody, okay, we're going to rehearse once, and we would just you know, hit the record button without telling them, and then we'd do five takes after that, and that was always the best take, right? Because they, they, weren't, they weren't thinking about being on camera. They were, just, they were just doing their script, right? So that's something you can do to kind of make this a little bit easier for yourself. One big thing, too, is don't be afraid to break this up into pieces. YouTube videos are almost always going to be heavily edited, and you can put multiple takes together, right? So if you do one take and this first part is good, but the second part sucks, you can cut that part out, replace it with a second part from another video, and that's going to give you a little bit better content. Um, one other thing is you might want to actually change where you're sitting in the shot a little bit based on that. I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of my, my steps here. Um, but that's also really helpful. So as you're thinking this through, as you're structuring your script for the video, make sure you keep that in mind as well. Is how many times are you going to record it? Can you move around in the frame? Any sort of visual variety is going to is going to keep people engaged, right? So you see a lot of agents where their first few sentences they're on the right side of the shot, second couple they're on the left side, and they sort of move around a little bit, and then they'll be in the middle. That's just to keep people engaged, to keep them interested, to keep them focused. Uh, worth thinking about as you're going. One other part of this, right? One of the reasons your idea needs to be really simple to understand 
is that the thumbnail is one of the most important parts on YouTube. Now, a lot of you probably already know that because you've, you've created a YouTube channel already, but you gotta have a clickable thumbnail. And you gotta remember, you think about the user experience. Anytime you're, you're trying to make a better piece of content, think about how people consume that content. So how does YouTube work, right? We go on, we're looking for one thing, and so that's the search part, right? So if you're looking for something specific, you're asking a question, you wanna think about those keywords, those terms, right? Those should be in your script, they should be in your description. But that's only part of it, right? A big part of YouTube is I search for something, now I have a bunch of results, which one do I click on, right? The thumbnail is the visual component, component of that, right? So that's one version. The other part of where people see a lot of YouTube videos is I just watched a 10 minute video, but I'm not leaving, I'm gonna stick around, recommendations, right? So it pops up and says, hey, here's a couple more videos to watch. Why don't you stay around and spend another hour or two on YouTube so we can show you some more advertisements, right? This is where your thumbnails really shine. So this is where you're getting in front of total strangers who are not necessarily searching for the thing you made, that is how you get in front of new people, right? So these, these thumbnails, they need to be clean. It's generally recommended you make a ridiculous face. I, I think that sucks. I, I don't like having to always make ridiculous faces, but it works, right? So if you put your face on there, um, a lot of times the bigger the better. In fact, in this one, I, I probably would have made myself a little bit bigger in hindsight. But you want to look, you want to emote, right? So it's emotion. That's what you're trying to show on your face here. Um, so that's what you're ultimately going for, right? So it, it, different emotions are gonna come across differently. You're gonna see, you know, that one, I, I don't know what that face is supposed to be. I don't know, <laughs> goofy excitement, I guess, is what I was going for there, right? But you can, be, you can be angry, you can be stern, you know, whatever it might be, but the emotion is what you wanna show people, right? That's what's gonna get them to stop and pay attention and click. The other thing that's really cool about this is your face being in the thumbnail means even if they don't watch your video, they saw your face, right? I mean, real estate, I think we understand pretty well the value of putting your face in front of somebody. In fact, I tell folks, this is your logo. Forget your logo, right? I mean, forget your colors and all that kind of stuff. I just want people to see this. If they see my face over and over again, they're gonna remember me. It's gonna be easier to be top of mind. I'm gonna show up for them more often. So if, even if they don't click on the video, you've shown up, your face is there, they're more likely to remember you, right? Usually just a few words, you don't wanna have anything too complicated. And then in terms of what's in the background, again, keep it somewhat visually simple. I think in nine times out of 10, when I see a, a worse thumbnail, it's because there's just too much going on, right? People too, too much graphics, too many pictures, trying to accomplish too much. Usually the really simple one, somebody making a goofy face, and then something that's pretty clear what the video is about is going to perform very well. Last thing I'll say here is you can see the logo there, Canva, Canva is huge. Uh, who uses Canva? I'm just curious. Yeah, of course, right? I mean, Canva's amazing. One of my favorite companies of all time, growing like crazy. Um, but Canva's very easy to use, and they have a lot of video tools. We're not really talking about the video-specific tools, but I'll tell you, one of the easiest ways to make a really nice, polished video is just record yourself talking into a camera, go to Canva, drop it into a template, and it looks 10 times more professional. You can tweak the template, you can edit it. There's amazing, amazing stuff you can do there, right? So thumbnails is a big one. There are lots of templates, and a lot of these templates are based on popularity. You can search by how, how often they get used. And so in a lot of cases, just go to Canva, say YouTube templates, you're gonna get some good ones. Step number four, right? So filming, editing, and posting your videos. I mean, we could talk all day about this, obviously. Um, this is one of those things that, you know, the, the, this is where you're gonna differ substantially in terms of what you're ultimately going to be doing. I'm gonna give you some advice here um, in just a second about some of the stuff to do here. But one of the things I do wanna emphasize at least at this point in the evolution of technology, I don't necessarily think you need a fancy camera. So that's a question I get a lot when it comes to YouTube. What camera should I buy? Well, I've talked to a lot of the top YouTubers in real estate and most of them will say, look, I mean, if at some point I did buy a better camera just because I wanted to kind of you know, try a new challenge and whatnot, but yeah, I saw somebody holding their phone up over there, right? It's your phone. I mean, at this point, I, I just got a new phone. It's plenty, the phone I just got rid of would have worked just fine. In fact, I didn't, it was two years and I didn't feel like the cameras changed that much. You can shoot in 4K, some phones shoot in 8K. I don't know why you need 8K, but they shoot in 8K now in some cases. But you can shoot plenty with just a phone. A webcam is not gonna be as good, right? So you can use your webcam, but the video quality will be lower, right? So I do kind of recommend that you go with the phone. I don't know if you can all see it, but right here on the table, I am recording this right now. Um, I have what's called a tabletop tripod and then a little phone adapter that holds the phone on top of it. About 15 bucks on Amazon. 
probably all you need, right? So you really don't have to get into any sort of expensive equipment. Now, if you're going to go out on site, you're going to make those neighborhood tour videos, things like that. These modern phones have good enough image stabilization in them that you don't even need a gimbal anymore, which I, I didn't know that, you know, three, four years ago, if you told me that was coming, I would have not believed you. But now you can be all kinds of jittery and it comes out smooth. It's amazing, the technology. So don't overcomplicate this stuff, right? Let's try to keep things relatively simple. Now, I will give you some advice. I'm going to give you a couple tips and tricks here on how to get quality footage. The first is lighting. This is indoor lighting in particular, right? So I want to ask you real quick, in this room, quick show of hands, if this, I'm going to ask you if this is good or bad lighting for video. So is, is this good lighting in this room? It's bad lighting. Okay, yeah, trick question, right? It's bad lighting, right? It's all up above us. That's not good, right? So you can see in this first picture, I'm standing underneath a ceiling fan with the lights turned on in a normal bedroom, right? We turned it into an office, but that's all that is. That doesn't look very good, right? You can see every single crease and wrinkle in my face. Anything that's sort of any sort of blemish is literally highlighted by the way the light is shining on me. The second picture, I'm in the same room. That overhead light is turned off, and I am simply standing in front of a window on a cloudy day with the blinds closed. That's it. That's only natural light, and you can see the difference in terms of the shadows. Now, in all fairness, I should have made the same face, so it's not a direct comparison, right? But especially look at my forehead, the creases in my forehead in that picture. Top one, they're highlighted, right? You can see them very clearly. Second, they're much harder to notice, right? That is the key to good lighting is just simply the direction of the light. So some of you have been doing this for a while, you probably understand that, but that's the main thing. So if you do buy lights, you just put them right next to the camera. But in most cases, natural light is actually going to make you look better because we're all used to natural light, right? I mean, most lighting that's, that's used in videos is meant to mimic natural light. So if you can, just simply try to get in front of a window. And if you're in a room with windows, just make sure that your, your equipment, your setup is facing the windows, right? So that way, if it is sunny out that day, the light is being reinforced, not, help, not working against you, okay? All right, now audio tips. Now this is one, there are so many layers to if you want, right? Main rule with audio is just don't be too far away from the microphone. That's the main thing, right? So you see, see this mic on my shirt right now? It's about six to eight inches. If you do this with your, I guess it's like hang loose or whatever, right? If you do this with your fingers, put it up below your mouth, that's about the distance you want a lapel mic from your mouth. Now, you can move it up or down. Down is gonna make your voice quieter, up is gonna make it louder. If you ever get any distortion in your recording, move it down. That probably means it's too close to your mouth, right? 10 bucks on Amazon, you can buy lapel microphones that plug directly into your phone model, so just look for one of those. Um, I will say for YouTube videos, I, I don't normally recommend buying equipment day one if you've never made a video before, but on YouTube, having good audio is pretty darn important, right? So if you wanna go ahead and invest in a lapel microphone, that's a good starting point. Then from there, you can spend a lot more money if you want to, right? Um, personally, the way that we have our setup in our studio is I actually have a boom pole over the top of me with a shotgun microphone that points down from above at my mouth that is out of my shot. So you don't see the microphone, you don't have to see anything on your shirt. It's right above you though, right? And you still want it as close as you can get it. So without it getting into the picture, but still nice and close, you're gonna get the cleanest audio as a result. The other nice benefit of a shotgun microphone is that it's directional. So it's gonna pick up your voice, but it won't pick up background sound, right? So if you have kids in the house or dogs or something else going on, that will reduce the possibility that that will get recorded in your audio and you'll get cleaner audio as a result. Backgrounds, when you first start, do not worry too much about it. If you're a little bit more advanced, personally, I'm a big fan of, of just sort of really clean, but somewhat textured backgrounds, right? So you can see in this example, uh, that wall behind me is actually covered in shiplap, which is just basically pieces of wood siding is kind of what that looks like. And you get a nice sort of textured look. Um, I get a lot of compliments on that because it's clean, it's not a distraction, but it is, it's still got some texture to it. It's more to look at than just a clean wall, something like that. Now you can go further and you can actually start to add uh, you know, knickknacks and stuff that sort of matches your personality. So if you wanna set up a little bookshelf, you wanna put something in the corner, just make sure that it's not a distraction, right? So I've seen some examples of this where there's so much stuff around that person that I, I don't actually pay attention to them because I'm looking at everything that's behind them. So you can go too far, but just make sure it's nice and clean, nice and organized, and that it, it reinforces who you are or what you do, right? If it has something to do with who you are and what you do, it's not gonna be too much of a distraction. 
And then one of the last things I'll mention here on sort of the tips and tricks on the, the equipment and whatnot is stabilization and framing. Uh, one of my ultimate pet peeves is framing, which just means where are you in relation to the edges of the video, especially when it comes to vertical video. I see all these videos where it's just the person's head, and then it's like 10 feet of open space above them, right? Like, you know, whatever. Um, but this is, this is a big deal because this is what makes it feel like they're looking at you face to face, right? So if you're framed correctly, you want to have your head in the top half of the image. You can even use like the rule of thirds. You can split up the, the image into thirds and try to put the, your eyes, your nose on that one third line at the top there. That's going to make it feel like you're sitting there right in front of that person. It's going to feel nice and intimate and it's going to make the video a lot more effective and impactful. If you put yourself in weird spots, it takes them away from the experience and it reduces that impact, right? One other thing to mention here is you do want to have a tripod. So that's probably relatively obvious. You don't need anything fancy. You've got a couple different examples there. Um, and you can shoot with both, uh, you can shoot both vertical and horizontal. Now, obviously, today we're talking more about a traditional YouTube channel. But I'll tell you right now, one of the best hacks on YouTube, so if you made a lot of videos already and you're already established, make shorts. Focus on YouTube shorts. They are killing it right now. I know a lot of folks that have a somewhat successful channel already, started putting out YouTube shorts and just blew up in terms of subscribers, right? So that, uh, that gives you some flexibility in, in terms of being able to make those. Uh, we do have an equipment guide with other options in it. It's uh, everything in it. I think it costs total less than 350 bucks. So if you want to scan that QR code, that'll, that'll give you access to that guide. All right, and then one last thing I'll mention here just in terms of how to, how to sort of behave on the videos. This is, in my opinion, the hardest part, right? It's just how do I come across on camera? Do I come across as comfortable? Do I come across as natural? The only thing that's going to make you better there is practice. And this is, again, why Mr. Beast recommends 100 videos before you expect any kind of results, because it takes that much repetition to get comfortable and confident, right? I'm going to give you a little bit of, a, of a, an exercise you can do. This is a, a fun one. I want you to take a one sentence statement, something like, I'm the best real estate agent in Las Vegas, right? Nobody's ever gonna watch it, so don't, don't worry if it's cocky. But I want you to say that sentence into a camera once, however you think you should, right? Like you're making a video. Say it a second time, but double your energy, right? Over the top. I want you to be really enthusiastic, really energetic. And then the third one should be like your best Billy Mays OxyClean infomercial, right? Like just over the top, tons of energy, probably on cocaine, you know, that's, you know, right? Like, I think that's how he died actually, but you know, but so you're just really just over the top crazy, right? And here's what's nuts. You're going to watch them back and you're going to be shocked by which one you like the best, right? And this, it may not be number three, maybe number three will be too much, but in a lot of cases, what you're going to learn from that exercise is how much you need to be putting into the camera and, and to get what you want out of the camera, right? And I will tell you right now, the enthusiasm is always cut down by the camera. So that exercise, what that does, you know, you can read all the tips on this slide, they're all valuable, but it sort of combines all of them, right? Because if I'm, if I'm trying to be over the top and kind of crazy and almost cartoonish in my delivery, and I watch that back and I go, wow, that, that just seems like I'm being, you know, compelling and friendly and confident, then that gives you a base to, to work from, right? And, and it, it's, it's really disorienting the first few times you do it when you're like trying to be twice as energetic and then you get used to it, right? So I do a lot of these trainings and I'm sitting in front of a camera and I'm all animated and basically almost shouting into the camera, um, but that's just now how I do it. It's not, it's not weird anymore. So you will get used to that part. All right, and then one other thing I want to include in here is just some suggestions on teleprompter apps. This is just a, a really common question that we get. Um, these are a couple of my favorites. So first you have CapCut. CapCut is a full-scale editing app on your phone. It is actually made by the same company that, that owns TikTok, right? So full transparency there. So I don't know if CapCut's going to get banned if TikTok does, and I don't think TikTok will get banned, but it is by the same company. But it's an amazing editing app. So you can literally edit an entire YouTube video on this app. Um, it also has a teleprompter built in. So if you need to record with a teleprompter, CapCut's a good bet. A little bit more advanced is what's called Prompt Smart Pro. The way Prompt Smart Pro works is really cool. So if you're a little bit more advanced and you're making some fancier YouTube videos, Prompt Smart Pro is a, is a teleprompter, goes on your phone, and you're typically going to use it with an actual physical teleprompter, right? So you're going to put this thing and you know you get the big big glass reflective tell, you know, so most of you probably don't have that. But if you get to that point, you take this, you put it in there, and it listens to what you're saying. So it will move the words as you read them. Right? So that's really cool. A lot of folks, they'll, they'll use a normal teleprompter and they can't get the speed quite right. 
we switch them to Prompt Smart Pro, and they fall in love with it because it just literally moves at whatever speed you're reading, and it works pretty darn well. So it's not perfect. Every now and then it'll, it'll jump ahead or it'll miss what you're saying, um, but I'm a big fan of Prompt Smart Pro, and it's like $20 for a one-year membership, which is not too expensive. Now, the last thing we'll say here is we'll get to some editing and just a couple quick tips. We, you know, editing, man, this, this is the kind of thing that can bog you down forever. I'll tell you right now, if you don't love the idea of being a part-time videographer, hire somebody to edit your videos, right? I mean, because it, it, it can become a part-time job. And most, again, of the top YouTubers I know, they might be somewhat involved in their editing at this point, but they at least have somebody that, that's helping them with it. And it's, it's just a lot of work, right? So if you're trying to focus on running a real estate business and you're spending 10 hours editing a YouTube video, that's not necessarily directly benefiting your customers, right? So I do recommend outsource this, outsource the, outsource this where you can. Um, if you're in my previous presentation, you heard me mention Fiverr. Uh, Fiverr is a freelancer website, very affordable options. You know, there's thousands of video editors on there. And you can get, you know, YouTube videos edited for, for $20 to $50 in some cases. Now, obviously, quality is going to range but based on price. So you should be willing to pay a little bit more if you want something a little bit nicer. Um, but that's a great way to cut out the work. Otherwise, you're going to spend some time on this, right? The main thing I want you to remember when you're editing these videos, because you probably had a seven to 10 minute script, it's a lot of you just talking, is you always have to ask yourself, what additional pattern disrupts can I add to keep somebody engaged, right? So that, the, back to my point earlier about moving yourself around on the screen, this, this is really where I should have mentioned that, but that's one thing a lot of YouTubers will do, is like in, in the first couple sentences, they're over here, and then they jump over to the other side of the desk, right? And they kind of move around in the shot a little bit, and all those little things, which that editing-wise is not that hard to do, it keeps somebody engaged, right? Because if I'm looking here and all of a sudden, boom, you jump over here and I have to look over just a little bit, that's just an enough that I'm, I'm curious now, right? This, this is all, all, all very subtle things, but they go a long way, right? Adding music can be a good way to do that. Um, stickers, you know, graphics that pop up, cutting to other shots, you know, B-roll. These are all things that can keep people engaged, keep people interested, and highly, highly recommend you put those in your videos. So if you do outsource this stuff, make sure you're looking for editors that can add those kinds of features to your video. And then the last part here is obviously posting. Um, I'm not gonna go over how to post, obviously that, there's plenty of demos of how to do that on YouTube. You're gonna wanna make sure you have that compelling thumbnail, add subtitles, right? We need to make our videos accessible, so make sure they have the subtitles on. And then you probably also wanna have that end screen so that you can add suggested videos from your channel. You can actually pick existing videos from your channel and say, hey, at the end of my video, show these to the person, and you can create this daisy chain where they just sit there on your channel and keep watching your content. So think about what it is you might want them to see after it. Um, and then obviously we didn't dive into this really aggressively in this presentation, but as you go, you wanna make sure you build keywords into your descriptions, right? Now, I don't do this a ton on YouTube. I mostly just focus on getting my videos out there, but I do have a big background in SEO. And at one point, actually, our company had like the number one guide in the world for flyer marketing, right? Which is a pretty niche thing. So putting flyers out on front doors. I used to have people from Europe sending me emails asking me questions about our guide. We actually had to take it down because it got because it kind of got annoying. So that, but that's the key here, right? What we did in that guide, so just to give you the takeaways from that, we had a couple keywords, right? We mostly made the best guide on flyer marketing ever written, okay? So you can get really sucked into the whole SEO part of YouTube. I gotta have the right keywords and write my description perfectly. Yes, it matters. What matters is that the video answers the question the person searched, right? That it gives them the information they're looking for and that it's enjoyable to watch. So I see a lot of people get really too far down this rabbit hole and they're thinking too much about the keywords instead of thinking, is this a good video, right? I wanna focus on making good video content. Last thing here is to analyze your performance and collect feedback and ultimately look for ways to adjust what you're doing, right? So you can see here on YouTube, you get a lot of data. I can't go over all the data with you right now, so I'm just gonna give you a couple quick tips and tricks to wrap things up here today. But you wanna keep an eye on the analytics. Here's what I'd recommend though. Do these first five videos 
ignore the analytics until you've done five, right? So a lot of you have already passed that point, good for you, you can look at this stuff. But if you put one video out and it gets six views and you go look at the analytics, you're not going to get any, there's no data, right? You've got to have a whole bunch of views, you've got to have some engagement, you've got to have people really working with your stuff before it matters, right? So you're going to see things like your, your, you can pick a date range, you can look at how many total views your video got over that time. That's obviously useful. What I find particularly useful though is uh, if we look at the different things you can look at here, is I like to look at obviously things like average view duration, which is gonna tell you on average how far into your video somebody got, but there's also charts that will show you when people drop off, right? So it'll say, okay, well after the first minute there was, you were down to 70% of your viewers and then after this amount of time, and what you do then is you look, is there anywhere along that curve where you see a sudden drop, right? So like, well, I don't know, I got two and a half minutes in and all of a sudden everybody stopped watching. Go back to the video, find that spot, and figure out what you did wrong, right? So what, what happened at that moment? Did you make a transition that was too long, right? One thing I see a lot of people do is they'll put these intros in their video where they, they give a description, and then it cuts to like a 30 second long pre-made intro that they put in every video, and all of a sudden everybody's leaving during that time, right? So look for those things, look for those signs. That's a big one. One of my other favorite metrics here, this is not too much specific to YouTube, but it's total watch time. And I love total watch time because I compare that to how much time it took me to make the video, right? Because that's ultimately what we're dealing with here. Video, the, the power of video is that I can put a few hours of time in and get dozens or hundreds of hours of attention out, right? So that's another one for just from personal feedback. Look at that number and make sure if you're spending 30, minute, 30 hours making a YouTube video and trying to make it perfect and you're getting 10 hours of watch time, maybe you should try to make them a little simpler, right? That's not a good ratio. We want that to be the other way around. So just a few things to think about there. Obviously, there's lots and lots of different statistics you can keep an eye on, an eye on, on YouTube. Using data and feedback, last thing here, is just really think about asking people for feedback. You can look at the data all you want, but I love to just talk to folks, right? So ask your, your bigger subscribers if they have feedback. If somebody posts and comments on your videos, that's the perfect person to reach out to, send them a message, see if they have anything specific they can share with you. And then ultimately, just see if you can talk to people who have watched your content, right? Send it out to your email list, send it to your family and friends, ask them to critique it. The more you ask for criticism, the more you ask for that feedback, it, it's vulnerable, it's challenging, but you will get better much faster, right? That's gonna, you're gonna get that, it's gonna cut through the noise, you're gonna get the thing that you need to hear. And if you got that one friend who's always brutally honest, make them watch your YouTube videos, right? That's where you're gonna get the best, the best possible feedback. We are officially out of time, so I wanna thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much.